Uh, other issues uh, would be that um, basically uh, data availability. We didn't have any data going into this. Uh, most of what we had were uh, uh, parameter values that were published uh, in papers that were coming out. Uh, most of the papers that were coming out would co have contradictory results in them. Uh, I mean, the, the, there was just a flood of published work on COVID-19 at the beginning. Some of it was uh, reliable, other parts of it was not. And we had to sift through and try to figure out what things would actually be important to kind of build into the models that we were designing and what seemed, you know, what seemed reasonable and what did not. On the, the other end, uh, once we got a lot of the things built up, uh, one of the biggest challenges we had was uh, integrating different systems. So you would, you know, with a university like Clemson or any major business, uh, you don't really know how hard it is to integrate different systems, especially if they've been in place for, you know, many years uh, to actually talk to each other and aggregate data in different ways, uh, which this was a very crucial thing at uh, several points, and I'll kind of touch on that later on. But uh, being able to do that was um, a mountain in its own right to try to climb. Uh, Communication, uh, trying to communicate uh, results, like literally we would get results one day, it would go up the chain, we would be asked by 10 different people to do 10 different things, and those results would go up different avenues, and no telling where all the things actually went, I, I'd love to know at some point. Uh, and then basically everybody had ideas. Everybody had ideas on how things should be done. So basically, you know, the things that we were coming up with, other groups were coming up with things. Every, again, the multitude of people who worked on this problem, uh, and by this problem, I mean the COVID-19 pandemic and Clemson's response to it, there, there were a lot of things going on. And I'm sure that you've heard some about some of them. So that's, you know, I, I throw that out as further challenges, but I thought that'd be interesting just to touch on it. But uh, I guess what everybody's here for is the underlying models that we ran. So, uh, the first class of models I'm going to kind of run through is uh, what's called agent-based models. Agent-based models are probably one of the more interesting and mesmerizing things that I've kind of dealt with over the last, I don't know, year and a half. So basically agent-based models are computational models. They're just basic simulation-based techniques that allow you to go through and investigate different systems and you do it through a series of rules, okay? Uh, so in the context of like the infectious disease modeling uh, problem that we're considering here, a uh, way to think about this is you have a series of autonomous agents that live in a space. And these agents can move around in space and based on the rules that you lay out, they can make decisions and they can interact. And when I start talking about agent-based models in that context, you can kind of imagine like, you know, these people that are wandering around in a great void and every once in a while as they're randomly moving, they interact with each other. And when they interact with each other, that interaction has certain governing principles that we control and we can uh, play out scenarios based on how we build rules around those, uh, those interactions, okay? And basically the idea is that uh, when you do that, it's not a way of looking at how, you know, how likely is it that a particular agent will become infected or how likely is it that an agent will spread the disease from, you know, from himself to agent number two. That's not the scale of things that we're looking at. What we would be looking at an agent-based model would be how the system as a whole is behaving and how things, how rules that we've put in place actually impact that system, okay? So that's, that's a, an emergent property. So we're looking for things that uh, are changing in the system due to how we change the rules of the game, okay? So that's, that's a very, very brief overview and I'll try to get something more concrete here in a little bit. But I wanna point out that, um, Agent-based models are not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. They, uh, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, 
There's a lot of general purpose software out there that can be used to develop agent-based models. Uh, actually, the first interaction I had with somebody with an agent-based model, they were studying uh, the uh, kind of the evolution of the crab population in Charleston. So they basically set up an agent-based model that looked at the river systems and they had crabs that were breeding and uh, being fished and were dying because of disease. And they had all these things kind of built in where they could study how crabs were, you know, the crab population was persisting. Uh, the guy who was doing that is not a mathematician, is not a statistician, he was a biologist. So, uh, you, and the idea that agent-based models are sound complicated, they're actually not that hard to pick up and use. And these uh, kind of specialty softwares uh, that I've got up here uh, allow you to do that in kind of a user-friendly way. Now you have to be able to write code, but that's not a big deal most of the time. Uh, the software package that we use is probably one of the more prominent. It's called NetLogo. And I'm gonna give you kind of a, a look at what NetLogo uh, looks like here in just a second. But uh, suffice it to say, there's a ton of stuff out there. And on top of that, if you look around just a little bit, NetLogo actually has a really nice repository of a lot of different types of agent-based models that have been put together that just span the spectrum on different types of problems. In particular, agent-based models have been used in places uh, in biology, ecology, epidemiology, business, technology, network theory, social distancing, social sciences, autonomous vehicles, and the list goes on. Okay, so, but for my purposes, I'm going to stick with epidemiology here. Okay, so what is, what does an agent-based model actually look like? Well, I'm going to try to describe it from the perspective of what's called a susceptible, infectious, uh, recovered uh, context uh, or removed. Some people call it removed. So this is an agent-based model. Uh, notice there's no math, right? That, that's probably depressing. But at the end of the day, this is kind of the system. That black box is, the, is kind of the, the land that these agents live in. Each one of the agents if, uh, are represented by these little uh, people. Uh, I want to call them stick figures, not stick figures, but they're little people. And each one of the people are actually assigned to what's referred to as a patch in the uh, basically this black abyss of uh, agent-based modeling land. Okay, uh, and each one of them are assigned a color. The color is basically for us because it makes it entertaining to kind of watch how things uh, kind of play out. Okay, so here, Basically, uh, the red in indicates that a person is infected, a gray indicates that a person is recovered, and green indicates that a person is susceptible, okay? Now, basically, once you kind of set things up like this, uh, the game is to set a series of rules and play the game out and see how things kind of persist, okay? So at the initiation of the simulation, basically we specify how many infected individuals that live in, uh, how many individuals live in the land, how many of them are infected, how many of them have already recovered and how many of them are susceptible. Uh, so, and what that does is that's representing an initial infection burden. Uh, for the Clemson uh, modeling projects, this was a, a kind of an important piece to the puzzle. Now, the reason that it is, is because if you imagine taking this land and saying, okay, well, I'm going to wipe it clean and I'm not going to put anybody that's infected in it, then what happens? Well, you move through time and nobody becomes infected because there's nobody, to inf there's nobody there to infect others. Okay, so trying to set like an initial burden is actually a very important part of the puzzle. Also, it's a very important part of the puzzle to set how many people have recovered from uh, a particular disease. And I'll show you basically why that works out in just a second. Okay, so once you've initialized your agent-based modeling land, uh, the next thing that happens is you start people moving, okay? So basically you have a concept of time. Uh, these are uh, accounted for through what are called ticks. And that's basically a one step forward in time. And at every tick, you basically have the agent move from wherever it is right now, from whatever patch in agent-based modeling land it's sitting on, you have that agent move. Now that the movement there can be very 
random. So you can do something like a random walk where basically you flip a coin, you go left, you go right, or you flip another coin, you go uh, up, you go down. So you can move just at random in that manner. Or you can have the agent literally warp from one patch to another. Or you can have the agent actually follow a pre-specified path from one location to another over time. Okay, now the reason that that's kind of important is uh, will become clear in just a little bit. I'm gonna talk a, bit, a little bit more about the more complex version of this and get away from this simplified version. But at the end of the day, the different ticks that we're talking about that, are that these agents move with, these ticks represent time and this time scale can be seconds, it can be hours, it can be days, it can be weeks, it can even be years. The important thing there though would be to actually set uh, all the model parameters with that in mind. And again, I'm gonna show you an example here in a second where that's that, that where that'll make that a little bit more meaningful. Okay, so that's basically the setup for the, uh, the agent-based model. Basically you have all of these agents that live in the land roaming around and randomly interacting. So an interaction would occur when you have one agent that lands on a patch with another agent. So if two agents are sharing a patch, they can interact with each other. If not, then they don't. Okay, so to define how the disease spreads through the population, uh, we, we basically set out to set up the infection dynamics, okay? Natural rules, okay? So only infected people can infect people, okay? So if you're gonna pass on the disease, you have to be infected. If you've recovered or if you're susceptible, you can't pass on the disease. Easy rule, right? Okay, susceptible agents are infected in a random manner, okay? Uh, so basically, uh, during a particular time point, if a susceptible agent occurs, uh, occupies a patch with another infected agent, we flip a coin and we say, if that coin lands heads, then the susceptible individual will become infected. If it lands tails, they won't. OK, that's the same idea that we have with, you know, if you're if you think about flu season and, you know, the person sitting next to you is coughing and sneezing and has the flu doesn't necessarily mean you have it, but it does mean that you, you have a chance of having it. So that's what we're representing when we have we put that chance in there is how likely is it that you are to spread that disease if uh, if you come into contact with somebody who is susceptible. OK, recovered agents are immune. OK, so meaning that if you have a, a recovered agent that occupies a patch with a infectious person, the chances, the, the probability that that recovered person will become infected again is zero. Uh, time to recovery. So basically, once you become infected, you will be infected for a period of time uh, until you're not. And then you are, are recovered. So you've transitioned from being susceptible to infectious to recovered. Does all that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, here, here comes the fun bit. Now, all of, everything that I've talked about is just to basically try to set up kind of the dynamics of how an infection would actually move through the population. And I'm going to kind of show you how you can set certain parameters in order to actually uh, mimic how actual diseases move through a population. Now, our goal was not to see how it moves through a population. Our goal was to actually try to examine how different mitigation strategies would impact uh, the spread of the disease. Okay, so to do that, we wanted to try to look at uh, different types of testing measures. Um, so when you get into testing, the things that you have to consider are basically, they become very broad and you never really think about it until you get into actually thinking about it. Um, so testing, uh, every test that you use is imperfect, meaning that if somebody is truly positive, you may not classify them to be positive. If somebody is truly negative, you may not classify them to be truly negative. So you have to account for testing errors as a part of the process. You have to talk, look at the testing cadence. So how often do you test? How many people, what percentage of your population gets tested? Uh, how frequently does that occur? Um, how fast can I get test results back when, uh, when a person is tested. That's important because when we first started doing all of this back in last fall, it took 48 hours, meaning that if you, if you were tested and you actually had COVID, you'd been walking around for two days, spreading it unknowingly, 
uh, before we actually got your test result back. So that 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 gap, that lag in testing uh, uh, test turnaround time is an important thing to try to understand. Uh, basically, for people who are symptomatic versus asymptomatic, we had a really good uh, return on people going and uh, getting tested when they're symptomatic for COVID. Uh, but people who are asymptomatic, they don't have any, they don't have no, no knowledge that they need to go get tested. So trying to look at how, you know, how frequently symptomatic people actually go and get tested versus uh, asymptomatic people get caught using surveillance testing. All of these things are different aspects of testing that have to be accounted for in order to kind of allow, uh, allow somebody to understand the impact of actually implementing a testing regime um, in a setting like this. You can look at other preventative measures such as face masking, social distancing, uh, lower occupancies in buildings. You can look at how treatment and vaccination impact uh, the spread of the disease. Uh, you can incorporate asymptomatic agents. Uh, you can look at other types of disease categories, associated, uh, associated durations, quarantine, vaccinated, hospitalized, death. So all of these are different states that people could be going through or that the agents could be going through in order to track kind of how, again, the disease and the mitigation strategies are impacting the system that you're looking at. Uh, you can uh, basically incorporate failing immunity, meaning that if you've had COVID once before, you might be able to, you might be able to contract it again, which we know is now possible. Uh, you can incorporate uh, different properties of the different variants. So basically, the original COVID strain uh, didn't perform the same as Delta. So basically, they had a dif different uh, what's called a reproductive number, uh, meaning how infectious they are. Uh, and you can uh, design the disease dynamics to uh, be demographic specific. So this is one of the things we didn't really do because we we're looking at a college population and most of our demographics are college age students. But if you were looking at modeling a, say a city, you could actually build in different age groups and say, well, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, morbidity uh, associated with this type of disease, it took a heavier impact on people who were older than those that were younger. So you can easily build that into these things too. Okay, so long story short, there's a lot of things you can build in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a short hiatus away from the slides and I'm gonna show you uh, one of our agent-based models that we put together. Uh, let me see if I can get this to come up real quick. Okay, can you all see that okay? I don't think it's transitioned yet. <laughs> there must be a really monstrous lag in this right now. Can you can y'all see? Uh, there he goes. Okay. All right. So this is one of our early net logo um, agent based models. I'm gonna walk you through very quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it on. And uh, basically I'm gonna let you, if you look at two places, okay? One would be the screen where you have a bunch of green dots and the other would be on the bottom right-hand side, you have uh, a panel here that my cursor is kind of floating over right now. Uh, these are two places that are gonna kind of report what is going on in agent-based modeling, okay? Um, and I'm going to go on and get this uh, set up and I'm going to get it running. That way we're not here for a month and a half waiting for it to do what it needs to do. Okay, but in this, in this representation, the green dots that are in that screen that are kind of moving around, which should, be, should pop up here in a second, those, those are people who are susceptible for the disease. The red are people who are uh, currently infected. And my daughter has decided to come join us. So, hold on one second, I apologize. Okay, so, uh, so the red are the infected individuals. Okay, here what we're doing is we are uh, looking at uh, a population of about 15,000 people. Currently, if you look at this susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered thing that my uh, mouse is hovering over, this is showing how many people who are susceptible, exposed, and infectious currently. Um, over here on the right, we have a series of toggles where we have basically the average time till basically people would develop symptoms. We have 
uh, a variance, uh, variance component for that. So we're actually allowing people to have a different time to symptom development. We have a average infectious period of 264, days, 264 hours, and we have a standard deviation there. So every person is gonna be infectious for a, a different random amount of time. Uh, then basically this, this part right here was looking at recovered. We weren't, we're not gonna run that for that long. Uh, the infectiousness here, I've got set just a little high, and that's uh, basically a 10% probability that if two agents interact, that they will become positive. And the reason I'm doing that is I want to actually see the end of the simulation before I go back to the talk. As you can see over here, right up to this point, we've only had a handful of days that have passed. On the right-hand side, we have a uh, test uh, testing interval. So this would be how often should we uh, conduct testing? Uh, and right now it's set at two days. Uh, percent tested would be the, per the percentage of the population that gets tested every two days. So it would be 10% of the people get tested every two days is the way it's set. We have the sensitivity of the test and the specificity being 97, uh, 0 0.97, 0 0.99 each. So these are the testing accuracies uh, that I was talking about that where you could potentially misdiagnose people. Uh, given that we were using PCR-based testing, uh, the sensitivity is specifically <laughs> for immunity, so that, that didn't have a big deal, as big of an impact. We have test turnaround time, and uh, then we have this max time till test. This max time till test deals with um, how long it takes somebody that's symptomatic to go and actually get tested. Okay, so as you could probably see while I am talking here that this green land that started out really green, it's starting to get red. And what's happening is I've got the, basically I've got the infectiousness right here like pegged out. And that's so that all this will kind of play along a little bit faster. And if I speed it up a little bit, you'll see it, it you'll see it kind of take over, okay? And you see the red just kind of going haywire at this point. And again, this is, this is by design. This isn't what we actually did for the administration. They would have probably really freaked out if we had. But uh, basically, uh, if your infectious was about 10, you would have hit the uh, peak of the epidemic in about 15 days. Okay, and over here on the right, the things that are being plotted, the green are the number of susceptible individuals that are in the population. The orange is the number of people who are exposed and the red are the ones that are infectious, okay? And what's happening here, if you look at these curves, as, as your susceptible population is dying off, and I'm not, I'm, I sh that was a bad term, as, as the susceptible population is declining, you'll notice that the number of infectious people start to turn around and go back the other way. The reason that this is happening is because there's nobody left in the population to infect. So it's like literally, it just, it's kind of self, it, it just kind of closes up on itself at the end of the day. But these, uh, it, I don't know if uh, y'all remember all the terminology that came out and back last spring when all this, you know, first emerged, everybody kept saying, we need to flatten the curve. We need to flatten the curve. We need to flatten the curve. This is the curve that they're talking about. And the way that you flatten that curve is you drive the, the infectiousness, down, infectiousness down or you decrease the reproductive number. Okay, here the reproductive number is also being reported uh, and the reproductive number is basically, it's the average number of people that a infected person will infect during the period of time that they can infect, okay? And in this example, right now, the reproductive numbers dropped off to nothing because there's nobody left in uh, agent-based modeling land to, to infect. But if you roll back and you looked, I had the infectiousness number here, the r not here, probably up around like 15 or 20, which is far beyond anything that COVID had to uh, provide. The only reason I did that is again, so that we weren't sitting here for 45 minutes watching this agent-based model kind of play out, okay? So we've hit about 60 days, which is about where most of our um, kind of simulations we'd run them out to just to kind of see how uh, all of this played out. So 
that that was an example of one of the agent-based models that we used to try to make some decisions uh, uh, going going back into the fall semester. Now, admittedly, the one that I just showed you was far, 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 far too simple to make really good uh, assessments on how different mitigation strategies would actually help out. And again, I didn't want to get too far into the weeds trying to show you all the different things that we built into these things, just to kind of give you an idea of what it was and how it works. Um, some of the things that we've tinkered with building in um, is basically the idea of familial, social, and professional networks. So one of the things that we did is we actually designed agent-based models around the dormitory structure on campus where we would have uh, 35 dormitories and we would have an off-campus population. Uh, we could assign all of the agents in the study in the simulated environment to one, one, either one of the dorms or to an off-campus population. Uh, in doing that, basically the people that were in the dormitories, they would have more social interaction with the agents that were a part of that dormitory. Uh, we developed ideas of how to actually create uh, classroom schedules and assign each one of the agents to classroom schedules so that we had people that were going from dormitories to courses and they would sit there for an hour with, you know, basically a group of agents uh, where if you had any one of them that was positive, they could spread it along. Uh, we had uh, all different types of uh, like mitigation strategies built in for masking. So like if you were masking in a classroom, we could like basically drop the probability that uh, an agent would, you could spread a disease if you were masking. We had things looking at masking compliance. There's lots of things that can be built in. It's basically, it's, it's mind boggling how deep and complex you can actually make these. Uh, going to a larger scale and looking at designing agent-based models to look at say an entire city, you can use what's called a property of homophily and homophily basically uh, saying that basically people of like backgrounds tend to cluster together. You can use that idea of homophily and you can actually create networks of people across an entire city that interact. Uh, you can basically, one of the things that we kind of played around with for a grant proposal was trying to build family structures because we wanted to try to understand how uh, young people transmit the virus to say older people and how, it, you know, going through, and this was for a vaccine rollout proposal, but it was basically the idea was who is the best group to vaccinate? Would it be vaccinating uh, the elderly where, you know, it, when vaccine was in limited supply, I should say that everybody should do it. But in, in, when it was in limited supply, it's like, should we go and vaccinate people who are at the front lines? Should we try to get people who are out and having to interact and then protect the elderly and family structure through basically getting the people who are being exposed the most vaccinated or should we vaccinate the elderly? To answer that question, you have to actually create a family dynamic so that you can actually have transmission going from an agent that you've sent out to go to work uh, and that contracts it at a job place and then brings it home to his family. And you know then, then it spreads to the family and then to say the grandparents. The only way to do that is to actually be able to have a family structure. And we actually looked at growing an entire, uh, it was a multi-generation uh, society where you have agents that actually come together, they reproduce and they create other agents and you can track basically their family structure uh, as they do that. Uh, again, you can create all different types of uh, really interesting uh, kind of like life dynamics, everything from kids going to school, people going to work, uh, having major sporting events. I mean, again, basically your creativity is kind of the limiting factor for Asian-based models. Uh, so with all that being said, and that's, that's one of those, you know, things that, yes, creativity is your limiting factor here, but it's also, that there is a point of diminishing returns. Uh, and a lot of the things that I'm talking about with the complexity, it, they may or they may not be needed depending on the desire with respect to what are you building the agent-based model to actually do. Uh, 
pretty much when uh, using these, one of the biggest limitations is having, having a logical way of setting all the parameters that go into the model. Some are very, very methodical. Some are very sensible, whereas others are not at all. And you have to go through and you have to look at uh, trying to dig through the literature and actually find parameter values that you can translate to your model. Uh, or you can actually design agent-based models and more or less fit them to data. And that's, that's actually a topic that's of uh, pretty big interest these days. Uh, and, that's, and you can approach that problem from what's called an approximate Bayesian computation. Okay, so this is a brief overview of agent-based modeling. Um, I'm going to transition now and kind of go to the other type of epidemiological model that we used, and that was a compartmental model. Uh, compartmental models are basically an analog to agent-based models in a lot of senses. Uh, uh, okay. Oh. Uh, Long story short, uh, what they do is they, they're set up to basically conceptualize the flow of stuff from a series of compartments to other compartments based on uh, a set of rules. And what it turns out to be is just a set of ordinary differential equations. So uh, compartmental models can be framed to be stochastic. By, by, by design, they're deterministic, meaning that basically you can set them up, you can put the parameters into the models and you can run them and you'll get one answer. If you run them again, you get the exact same answer. With the agent-based models, you don't get that. Um, basically, you can frame them to be stochastic by actually creating random events and like actually incorporating those into the construct. Um, you, can be, you can use these for a variety of different ways of looking at uh, these different uh, infectious disease, the spread of infectious disease throughout the population, uh, or you can even embed these guys inside of statistical models to est estimate different types of uh, parameters associated with uh, the spread of the disease. So compartmental models, uh, long story short, uh, they're pretty darn simple, yet they can be incredibly dangerous. Now, uh, I don't know if any of you remember back into the spring that uh, there were a lot of predictions that came out about how bad COVID was actually gonna be and they, they were just terrifying if you looked at them. And it turned out that a lot of those predictions were being made directly off of some of these epidemiological models that I'm about to talk about. And the reason that they were so bad is they, they were overly simplistic. And, uh, and that's where they were kind of, kind of that was their failing. So, and the over, overly simplistic one is, of course, the one I decided to uh, show you guys today. So, the most common would be the SIR model. Again, this is going to be an analog to that first little uh, agent-based model that I was showing you. Uh, you have uh, three different categories. You have the susceptible, the infectious, and the removed categories. Uh, same interpretation. It's just a different mathematical way of treating this. Okay. So, here, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at uh, look at this as a, a kind of a flow problem. So if you think about this, this figure is actually like, and that's one of the things you'll find if you read about compartmental models, is everybody tries to describe what's going on through a figure because it makes everything make perfect sense. Essentially, what you have is you have a susceptible population, you have an infected population, and you have a removed population. And people are flowing from the susceptible to the infected and from the infected to the uh, removed. That's it, okay? There are two parameters that govern this entire exploration. One would be this beta parameter, and that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be an, an infectious uh, pr uh, parameter. And then you're gonna have this gamma, and that's gonna be your recovery rate, okay? Okay, so basically to lay out the rules of how this entire process plays out, uh, I'm gonna kind of change a little bit of notation here. So this capital S of T, capital I of T, and capital R of T denotes how many people are in each one of the compartments. And then the lowercase versions of those are gonna be the proportion of people that are in those compartments, okay? So governing, uh, governing assumptions of the infection dynamics. Uh, basically one of them is that we are not gonna be adding any, anybody to the susceptible population. Okay, so we don't have a feedback loop where people who have recovered are gonna gradually go back to the susceptible category. We're not, we don't have that here. 
We're not going to have people uh, immigrating into the problem. So like, you know, from the university context, uh, it wouldn't make sense to think about this from we're going to start this before the semester begins. And then we'll have this huge influx of students to come in uh, because that influx of students are bringing a lot of people to the susceptible category. So you, you don't have an immigration into the susceptible category. Okay, the only way that you can leave the susceptible group is by becoming infected. Now, for our purposes, that was somewhat reasonable. Now, in a larger scale population study, uh, if you're looking at this, uh, you might wanna have something that accounts for death rates in certain parts of the population. Okay, so like in, in the elderly population, you wanna account for that you're gonna have certain people coming out because of natural causes. You could have people that are moving out of that area due to job displacement. There's a lot of different reasons that you might have them leaving the susceptible category other than just going to the infectious category, okay? The transition rate from susceptible to infectious depends on the number of susceptibles, the number of infecteds, and the contact between these two groups, okay? So if you have an incredibly large number of infected people and you have an incredibly large number of susceptible people, the, the rate at which people are transitioning is going to be astronomical, okay? Whereas if you have a small number of infected and a small number of susceptible, basically you're, the transition is going to die off and not, not happen at all. Okay, so conceptually, if we think about each infected individual, individual has a fixed number of contacts, okay? So each infected person has a fixed number of contacts capable of spreading the disease, okay? That, that's what that beta represents, okay? So again, this is one of those things you have to stop and kind of think about it for a minute because it's not that we're gonna be moving beta people out of the susceptible category because the number of contacts, the pe person that's infected could be coming in contact with other infectious people or they could be coming in contact with other recovered people. So the number of infections that actually, the number of new infections that occur are actually gonna be the number of uh, contacts that are capable of transmission, transmitting the virus times the, num, uh, the proportion of susceptible individuals. Now, why this makes sense? Well, we're making the assumption that basically uh, this infected person is actually randomly interacting with the other people that are in the system, okay? Uh, that's a homogeneous mixing uh, assumption. So if they're randomly interacting with the other people that are in the system, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna interact with beta of them that they could transmit the virus to. If the proportion of pe uh, people in the population that are susceptible is this little s of t, then on average, the proportion of people that that infected in individual interacts with that they can transmit the virus to is beta little s of t, okay? So long story short, uh, that gives us basically the jumping off point to get this thing started. Last thing would be uh, the recovery dynamics. Uh, basically, this would be a fixed fraction for gamma. Uh, gamma, gamma, if it takes uh, 10, 15 days to, uh, on average to clear the disease, then gamma would be set to one over that, okay? Once you have those, then basically uh, the whole process is a flow problem. You have a rate of flow that's coming out of your susceptible category. You have a rate of flow that's coming out of your infectious category. And you represent the whole system as a, um, a set of differential equations. And that, that's what these guys right here are. Okay, so this, this uh, top one here, that's the rate of flow out of your uh, susceptible category. It's flowing into the infectious. Then we have an outflow of this gamma IT and that gamma IT is going into the uh, removed category. And that's it. Solve a system of differential equations with that set of uh, parameters and you have the epidemic curve. That's it right there, okay? So basically this is showing how the susceptible category, which is in blue, is uh, behaving over time. Uh, you have the uh, infected category, that's the red, and you have the green being the recovered. And this is what the solution to that, uh, that SIR compartmental model would look like, okay? 
Okay, so limitations. Uh, first, it, this is a very, very, what, once you set up the initial, the initial state, you specify the parameters, this is very easily solved. Uh, computationally, it's trivial. Uh, but downside is they are overly simplistic. So the way that we build out the compartmental models is we start conceptualizing all of these different states that people could go into. So, uh, and again, this is just additional compartments. So we can add things like an exposed category. We can add quarantine category. We can add uh, people who have been vaccinated. We can add people who are symptomatic, asymptomatic. Uh, you can allow for reinfection. You can stratify the population based on demographics. You can have interactions uh, between and across different strata. Uh, and you can even incorporate different types of uh, mitigation strategies, such as testing and quarantine. Uh, you can also, you can go from doing a hard solve to actually doing a, a discrete solve where you can kind of break things apart. And over certain time spans, you can actually implement different types of mitigation strategies uh, and solve the problem discreetly rather, rather than directly. This, uh, this is a kind of a diagram of a, uh, uh, an earlier version of one of the SIR models we put together for uh, Clemson, to help Clemson make some of their decisions. This has a uh, susceptible category that flows into an exposed category. Uh, the exposed category then can go into three different categories. One would be that they are tested as a part of testing efforts and they go into uh, a tested positive or a quarantine category, or they can transition to being either asymptomatic or symptomatic. We split based on this because basically the asymptomatics, uh, we, we, if you're asymptomatic, you'd never go get tested because you think you have something. So basically uh, you would continue to infect without actually knowing. So basically, uh, we have a, a proportion that goes to this asymptomatic category to kind of capture that uh, effect, whereas people who go to the symptomatic category actually after just a couple of days become symptomatic and then they would go get tested and then they actually uh, go to this test positive group. Uh, some of the infectious people never go to the test positive, they go straight to the cover because we never catch them. Uh, both the test positive go to isolation and then after they spend their time in isolation, they go to the recovered category. Now, this is again, all, very easy to represent as a set of differential equations. Not only is this easy to represent as a system of differential equation, but this system that I'm showing you right here is actually a, a subset of 36, of 36 components that each component looked like this. And the 36 components were put together to represent 35 dorms in an off-campus off population. Okay, so for every dormitory and for every uh, person who lived off campus, we had this exact model set up and we had that model tied together so that you had interactions across all those different populations. And we did that to basically be able to look at different types of testing strategies. Okay, and this, this kind of give you an idea of what these models were telling us based on different types of testing strategies. So this was a run where we had a uh, on-campus population of 6,273 uh, students that were allocated to 35 dorms, and we had an off-campus population of 12, roughly 12,000 students. Um, what we had at our disposal was 450 diagnostic tests per day that we could use. Now, uh, what we ended up looking at is we looked at, okay, what would happen if we didn't do any testing at all, okay? That's what's in the light green. What's in the light green here is actually the proportion of positive COVID-19 cases that existed, not that were detected. These would be the ones that would have existed if we had done only voluntary symptomatic testing only. Uh, basically, the blue here is random surveillance testing. So you take that uh, almost 19,000 people and then you start randomly testing 450 per day and you hope that that makes an impact. Uh, then this pink here, the, that's something we called surveillance-based informative testing. And this was something that we actually implemented for a little while on Clemson's campus. Uh, this strategy basically uh, would take all of the 36 clusters, the 35 dormitories and the, uh, the off-campus population. And based on testing, what we would do is we would estimate the prevalence 
uh, in those different areas. And once, once we estimated the prevalence, what we would do is we would direct testing to areas where we found a, an elevated prevalence level. Um, and over, overall, that seemed to be pretty effective. So if you think about uh, those were three different testing strategies that through the development of that compartmental model, we were able to go through and evaluate how effective each of them would be. And the, the green here represents kind of a baseline for comparison in terms of if you did nothing, this is what would happen. If you implemented these testing protocols, you would probably have roughly half to a third fewer cases that actually emerged. Okay. All right, so that's it for models. I thought I would take just a few seconds to point out a few places that our work and all this modeling helped us convince the administration of doing certain things. Uh, what you're looking at right now is the COVID-19 tracking uh, tracker that uh, it's still up. You can go type in COVID-19 Clemson dashboard and be one of the first things to pop up in Google. The uh, figure that I've got here is for the fall of, 20, uh, uh, fall of 2020. And uh, basically this gray line here is going to be the first thing I talk about. That gray line represents the point at which we transition from virtual learning to in-person learning. Uh, back back in uh, the fall. I, that's when everybody came back to the dorms and we started doing a lot. One of the things that our modeling uh, did over the summer that we were, it was fairly easy to convince the administration of was that if we opened the doors and we brought people back without doing anything, uh, you would bring a lot of cases back to the university and being a close and fine uh, environment, it would go badly very quickly. Uh, so basically, that was the pre the uh, pre arrival testing that everybody did back in the fall, and if you look at kind of the time frame from about eight twenty nine to uh, the point that the uh, semester started, that's all of the pre arrival testing that uh, was mandated, and that alone prevented almost uh, it was a little over two thousand cases from coming into the university. Uh, at which point that uh, everything started back up. Uh, one of the first things the university started doing, uh, there was a little bit of a lag due to uh, trying to work out testing agreements and that's some of that administrative stuff that I'm talking about. That's what that white gap right there is. Uh, but basically uh, testing, uh, we started doing random testing um, around the, the 21st. Once we started doing random testing, one of the things we realized is that the pre-arrival testing wasn't wholly effective from removing all of the COVID cases and kind of re resetting the clock. Uh, so from basically a black, this black arrow here until where the orange arrow is, that's where we implemented uh, what we referred to as the uh, surveillance-based informative testing. And that was actually allowing us to drive the, the overall prevalence on campus down. And it allowed us to get to a point that um, uh, Delphine Dean could get her, um, her CLIA lab up and she could start running samples. Once she did that, we swapped to uh, basically weekly testing uh, at the Orange. And we basically were able to keep things at a very nominal level from that point forward. As can be seen from what happened last spring, and if you, I was also going to throw in what's going on now. But basically, the moment that we could do uh, arrival testing and also go to weekly testing, which is what our models were saying that we really needed to do, it basically eliminated a lot of the COVID um, cases that were on campus. Okay, so in summary. We built a lot of agent based models. We built a lot of compartmental models. We looked did look looked at doing that to assess everything from dorm and classroom arrangement to testing and even isolation and quarantine. That's something I, don't, I didn't even get into. The, uh, the period between this black arrow and the orange arrow, I had to retask everything that I was doing and I had to basically provide uh, quarantine projections two weeks out to basically uh, the administration to say, this is where we're headed because uh, we had a certain number of uh, quarantine and isolation beds. And if we exceeded that, the university had to shut down. Uh, so we, we had to provide those projections literally daily for uh, about a month to make sure that uh, we didn't exceed that capacity. Uh, 
We also have worked to build these uh, these uh, compartmental models into the uh, wastewater testing that's going on and uh, trying to come up with ways to use the wastewater testing results to uh, predict how many actual cases we have in our area code. Uh, likewise, and then, you know, kind of a summary on the challenges here, parameter configurations, interpretation, computation, and building everything to reflect reality. There's, there's, there was never an end to the challenges that were kind of put in front of us in front of the, uh, to develop these epidemiological models. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I think I timed it just about right. So does anybody have any questions? Any questions? So I have one question. Uh, which, okay. which one of the two categories of models were more suitable for Clemson? Uh, ultimately, we went. Uh, I, I, I don't have a great answer for that. I will say that ultimately we went to the compartmental models because they they are faster to develop. Um, the agent based models are very slow to develop, and they're also very slow to uh, valid, slow to develop, slow to validate, and slow to basically investigate different types of things. So they're just they're very slow all the way around. Um, with that being said, that's the reason we transitioned to the compartmental models because literally we would get calls uh, almost daily saying, well, what about this? What about that? So we, we couldn't adapt uh, the agent-based models fast enough to accommodate all of that, whereas we could with the compartmental models. So from that sense, I would say that the compartmental models probably were better suited for this particular situation. Um, I think you, we probably could have gone deeper with the agent-based models and we could have looked at, uh, you know, a more complex system and teased out more uh, granularity if we had stayed with the agent-based models, but it would have been a lot slower to get there. Okay. I sort of one more related question, you know, you mentioned how do you validate it? So how did you validate your models that they were predicting? Because there was well, no control experiment, right? Yeah, so um, <laughs> a lot of the validation was compared against the data we're seeing. So if you think about these problems from a regression standpoint, um, and let me roll, let me go back up here. Basically, these curves, right? Uh, there it is. If you and this is an overly simplistic uh, uh, answer to your question, but if you think about these curves as basically the true underlying uh, burden, or the true underlying susceptible population, or whatever, you can actually relate these curves back to the data that you're seeing. Um, so that's that's one of the benefits of the more simplistic SIR models. Also, one of the big benefits to the SAR models is that a lot of the parameters that we have to specify as a part of these guys. So if you look at the, this model that we have right here, uh, there is pretty good consensus in the literature about how to set this beta parameter. Uh, and, and, there, and the reason I say that is there's a direct tie between that beta parameter and what's called, the, what, I, what I mentioned previously, the reproductive number. Uh, the this uh, SE that I have here, this is actually known. Uh, this is a, a characteristic of the diagnostic test that we have. Uh, this this SE, this SE here, same same difference. Uh, here we have the this alpha parameter. The alpha parameter represents how many people are transitioning to the asymptomatic versus the symptomatic categories. That's also something that's pretty well understood in the literature about COVID at this point. So a lot of these, and then basically you have uh, this kappa that's here. This is how long it takes to turn around uh, the diagnostic test. So the point from being tested till you actually get the test result. That was something that we knew. Uh, this gamma parameter here is how long people actually are infected. So that, that's something that we know. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a nice thing about the compartmental model is that especially with, with respect to COVID, 
and the fact that everybody's using these types of SIR models, you have a lot of guidance about some of the parameters that are there. Now, when you go and you start building these things out and making, you know, making them bigger and bigger and bigger, some of the parameters do become a little bit more uh, difficult to specify. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Other questions? Do you have any questions? Um, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, OK. Um, so I have, I don't know, two or three questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the easier one. Um, so what do you think the um, I guess the pros and cons versus, um, you know, using the agent based model versus um, if we just use like, you know, doing macro simulation instead of doing micro simulation. So basically viewing things from a more aggregate level, because I think you mentioned, you know, the goal of it, after all doing the agent base is the kind of similar to doing the aggregate approach. Yeah, so, and that's, and that's um, I guess, uh, to touch on that, it would be, it depends on what outcome you're looking for. Uh, so if you're, if you're simply wanting to understand how, say, a disease spreads through a population, you can do that with a very simplistic model. You don't need complexity. Uh, if you're trying to understand how diseases spread to the elderly, then that does require kind of that micro look at the system because you have to build in that intricacy for, for it to be more realistic. So the, I guess, you know, not to, not to sidestep your question, but it depends largely on what the overall outcome that you're trying to investigate actually is. Does that make sense? That's, that's, almost, that's almost equivalent to... Oh uh, yes, yes, it does. And that's um, that's also, that's also very akin to a lot of what gets done in like finite element models uh, and engineering systems. So you know, using very rudimentary engineering theory, you can describe a lot of a lot of different things. Uh, now, and you depending on if you, all you're really wanting to know is like you know how strong is the structure. You know, you can do that from a very, very, you know, basic level. Whereas if you're wanting to look at like how, you know, how you have different types of buckling and things like that, you have to go to a higher fidelity model to actually be able to uh, examine those types of properties. Right. Okay. Um, so I personally, I think the advantage of agent-based model is just allow us to maybe examine like a subpopulation or like a subset of a particular, you know, population of interest. Uh, so like you said, like elderly and these type of stuff, we can zoom in compared to if we're just doing an aggregate approach, you can probably, you're probably yes. having a harder time observing them. So you, you can, you can do, you can do that from the departmental model context also. So you can actually, you can set the compartmental models up uh, and, and we did this for, we did it for dormitories and like an off-campus population. But you could also do that based on uh, different types of demographics. So like you could have elderly population, you could have kind of middle-aged, you could have children, you could break them all up into different compartments and then you can have all those different compartments interact with each other. So you can still get to that type of granularity through the compartmental models. Mm, okay, yeah, I, I just didn't know anything about the compartment uh, yeah. mental model until today. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Um, okay, second question is um, actually my last. Um, just, I have um, questions about how you would make the agent-based model work uh, of testing out different, I guess, uh, strategies. For example, like uh, wearing masks or like people washing their hands and everything. Um, is there, do you think it's like, you know, because we kind of, just depreciated the probability of uh, contracting certain disease of a certain percentage to start with. Of course, we're going to see at the end, at the even at the aggregate, aggregate level, that we're going to see less infected people, right? Um, yeah. So I, I was just wondering. 
And, and you, you hit the nail on the head. So basically the way that uh, a way to kind of look at the, the effects of say uh, face masks uh, would be to say, okay. Um, and again, it, this is like one of those things that like to look at the, the effect of face mask and you probably would want to create something that's a lot more complex because you, you have to like have, dip, you know, interactions and you want to say, okay, well, what if we do face masks in the classroom, okay? And let's say that face masks are 80% effective. What is the impact of that on mitigating disease spread, okay? And, and, and an easy way, as soon as you say that's 80% effective, then basically when you have all those agents come into contact, you basically, you would decrease the probability that they're able to uh, track the disease by the appropriate amount and you, you can see that outcome. Now, the challenge there, as you probably probably already thinking, is how do you set that 80%? And typically what we were looking at is we were looking at uh, based, everything that we did, we basically looked at a range of values and basically said, okay, we don't, you know, we don't know that it's definitively 80%, but, you know, let's, let's see what happens if it's, you know, 40%, what if it's 60%, what if it's 80%, what if it's 100%, you know, what, how, how much impact is it having? And, you know, is it, is it a, is that a, is that a viable mitigation strategy under all these different types of configurations? Yeah. Uh, okay. Th thank you for uh, answering this question. Yeah. I, I just, I was just thinking um, to myself because if we wanted to use it as like, a, you know, testing out different strategies of mitigating a certain disease, um, you can still calibrate it, um, you know, compare it to historical data. And then, like you said, you know, testing out how much of the actual percentage that would have mitigated and then implement it further to predict in the future. But yeah, I, I think it's very cool stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? How about, uh, how about out there in Etherland? Any other questions out there? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Wonderful talk. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Doing that. It was an exciting talk for everybody except for my daughter. She didn't quite make it through, but 75%. Y'all have a good weekend? Yeah. And we will see you on uh on a weekday. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.